this evening to recognize a very special lady who is a part of the Wayne Missing Area School District, and that is Kathy Schweitzer, who is going to be retiring. And so she has been with us for about 11 years. She started as a special ed support staff at the high school, and now you're over at the Hills as a paraprofessional. And so I, Kathy always has a smile on her face. I love when I get a chance meeting with her in the hallway because you just make me feel good. <laughs> and you're always smiling. You're always so positive. And you've just been a true blessing to the district. And we just want to thank you for your years of service that, that you have given to our families and also to our students. Your, your caring is, is evident in everything that you do, and, and we're going to miss you. So I want to thank you for, for your years of service. Don't hold on. There's more. There's more. It's not over yet. I have a resolution from the school board that I'd like to read to you. Um, whereas Mrs. Kathy L. Schweitzer has served 11 years as dedicated member of the support staff of the Wyoming Missing Area School District, and whereas Mrs. Kathy L. Schweitzer has tendered her resignation from the employee of the district for the purpose of retirement effective June 9, 2016, and whereas the board of school directors of the Wyoming Missing Area School District wishes to recognize her for her valued service and officially record its appreciation, be it he be it hereby resolved, the Board of School Directors for the Wyoming Missing Area School District observes with regret the resignation of Mrs. Kathy L. Schweitzer from its support staff and expresses its deep appreciation for her service and dedication, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be recorded in the minutes of the meeting of the Board of School Directors of the Wyoming Missing Area School District held on May 23, 2016, and that a copy of this resolution be presented to Mrs. Kathy L. Schweitzer. to recognize uh, Mrs. Joanne Weller. She couldn't make it tonight. But Mrs. Weller has been a wonderful PTA president. And when I think of Joanne, I always think of how quiet and unassuming she is. So it was no surprise to me that when I asked her uh, what she felt the highlights of her time as president were, she said she was not one to mention her highlights. Yeah. That <laughs> she said the PTA has great committee chairs and that they work together no matter their differences as a group and it's not just one person. You do the best you can do, and that's all anyone can ask. And that is all anyone can ask. And Joanne, with her quiet, unassuming ways, led the PTA for two very successful years with aplomb and grace, and we are extremely grateful for the time and energy she gave to our schools. So she couldn't be here tonight, but we just wanted to, to recognize her. She deserves her. She deserves her. So moving on with the agenda this evening, we have invited Sandra Miller to join us and talk a little bit with us about the basic education funding. So back in 2014, and to give a quick background to here, the circuit riders were selected. And the circuit riders are a group of about 11 folks, maybe, who is it down to eight? So they were adding us, adding IUs to us. So it's a group of people who have been going around the state to talk about the importance of fair funding for school districts and, and what fair funding looks like, sounds like, and what it should be. So we invited Sandra to come in and speak with us for about 15-20 minutes just about what funding formulas are, the importance of it, and also what we can do locally to have some influence with what we should be able to do. All right, what's up? I'm, I'm a walker, I stroll, so I'm, I promise I would try to stay here without actually, are you walking up with it? I'm not still good at holding it, so we'll see how it goes. Um, 
But thank you very much. Just to give you a little personal background about me as well, I'm a school director at South Nevada School District. I'm in my 11th year there, um, and that's how I got caught up in this whole process for the campaign for fair educational funding. I was involved with some advocacy work with uh, uh, PSBA, and they told me about this position and the campaign, and that's how I started. So I, I sit in your seat um, on a regular basis. Um, I'm going to go through this as quickly as possible, just so you know, but please stop me. Um, I do have a tendency, um, this is a lot of detail, this is a lot of information, but we really feel it's important for school directors to get familiar with the formula. This is how your dollars are now being driven out. Pennsylvania, and we were hoping today to have a vote on it, but we are still one of three states that do not have a funding formula permanently put into our school code. Uh, this current year, you did have your funds pushed out through the formula for the additional $150 million, but it's not a permanent uh, fixture for us. Um, and we believe that um, it is essential for Pennsylvania to do so. The only other states that do not have it is North Carolina and Delaware, but they both are exceeding the amount of money that we uh, use for funding. So the Campaign for Fair Education funding we came into place. It's about 40 organizations. Um, that have grouped together to work towards becoming a stable and equitable funding system. Uh, we're a grassroots effort. Um, we are divided up um, through uh, circuit writers throughout the state based on my use. But we have organizations that are a part of this from Pittsburgh, as well as Philadelphia, as well as every area in between. We worked with the General Assembly um, with the commission that started through Act 51, which just came out through the Corbett administration. The commission came out with a recommendation on June 10th, and this is what they recommend. In front of you, there's a spreadsheet that I provided for you, and we're going to walk through what this is. There's actually two components to the funding formula. You have the student part, and you have your district components, and we're going to do it. So the numbers you have in front of you are the, the numbers that actually were used this year for your school district. The first two columns we'll get to in a little bit. For some reason, I think it was the business people that put these together, they think that we need to see the income numbers and the local effort number first. Uh, but I know that we really care more about the <laughs> student counts tonight, so that's the next columns that you're going to see. So we're going to review the top part, and then we'll go through the bottom part. The first thing you're going to want to make sure that you understand is that the formula does help all, to all school districts. It is only uh, applicable to uh, new dollars. You have a base year that is currently affecting, so the amount of money that you received in year 14-15 is the same amount of money you will continue to receive. All school districts across the Commonwealth are in that situation. So it helps grow in school districts because if you had, had an increase in your demographics and more students, the formula will now reflect that. If you're a declining school district, then there are some that have actually lost a substantial amount of students. They have a fixed base year, so they will not be losing funding. We believe it really helps the high poverty school districts. You'll see when you look at the poverty numbers, it, is, it, you, it reflects the demographics and the needs of the population. Again, just to remind you, it's only for new dollars and it's only designed um, as a base year kind of a calculation. The bottom numbers is kind of a point on here. Um, is that there, this is not an adequacy factor. You'll hear some adequacy talk going on right now. Um, if we do small amount of money that we push through, since it's only new dollars, it can take us decades to actually rectify this. So we're obviously, as a campaign, asking for a larger amount of money. Okay, I think I said most of that. So let's go on to the factors. So what the basic first number you're going to have, you're going to come out with what your total ADMs. That's a three-year average of the ADMs. Those, these are reports and factors that are submitted in on your PIMS report. So it's not any additional work for your school district. This information is already submitted into PDE, and PDE actually does all the calculations and then tells you what your numbers are. Uh, but you can actually look at the PDE website. It's uh, incredibly difficult to, to read. It looks like this. There's five different pages and tabs that you have to go through just to get why this seems done, um, why this seems numbers. Um, but it's uh, something that I can make sure that you have that uh, to access. You can just go to PDE and you hit on the budget fund and it gets you right into the VEF dollars in PDE. So you have your three-year average. Most districts um, have some variation in their three-year, their year-to-year, so they felt the three-year average 
kind of accounts for any um, changes that you have. Your school district in your three years went, you were low, and then you went high, and now you're kind of in the middle. So your average actually assisted you. So if you look at your number, that's your three year. The next number we're going to go over is going to be your poverty weights. Poverty uh, information is from the American Community Survey. It's a federal census data that's now. We feel it's a better reflection of what actually occurs in your community. It's your age of 6 to 17 year old residents. It's not your students. It's the residents in your area. Uh, you get a .6 added for every student that falls into that category. Moderate poverty, which is your 100 to 184, it's very similar to your free and reduced lunch calculations, but it's using federal dollars. You get a .3 for the students that fall into that category, and then you have your added weight. Concentrated poverty is for uh, districts that exceed 30% poverty in that community. Your school district does not fall into that, so you don't get an added bonus to that. But what that reflects is that there's uh, an agreement at the commission level and among most individuals that extreme high poverty uh, requires additional resources to make sure that those children are successful in school. So you're going to add all those poverty numbers up and you'll see that that is the two, your first column you're going to have is your percentage, the next column is the actual students that get added into your um, ADM. Then you have your percentage for why missing, that is the percentage that's moderate poverty and how many students then were added into that. So you're following me through. Then we get to the students. Yes? The, the calculation is the percentage is based on your residence. And then they take your ADM, they multiply that percentage, and that's how they drive it out. But to add to it, they don't use your three-year ADM. They use your most recent uh, ADM. So your 1415 is the calculation that they're using to drive poverty. This is really key when we're looking at reporting to the state that we make sure that our data is correct. Because when this goes through, yes. we want to make sure that the data is where they want to capture all those dollars that they cost. But it, it's the, it, they, the, they felt um, using the residence data was the, the, the cleanest number instead of using free and reduced lunch. Um, I'm sure that your school district isn't one of them, but there are school districts that have community lunch programs where um, if you exceed a certain percentage, um, everyone in your building then gets free and reduced lunch. So if you participate as, as a community school, you didn't have a number that would be reflective of your poverty. So they had to go to a federal census data. And it's probably the cleanest way, because that really reflects your community. So then the next is ELL. It says LEP. You'll see it different, but it basically is your language learners. Um, there is belief in it, and everyone agrees, especially at, um, when we have to look at the resources that are required, that students that need to have the extra services for their language um, skills, um, they add a 0.6 weight to those students, and that's the population that you have there. So that gives them more resources for you if you have a high population of language learners. And then a charter school. This is a somewhat of a, a step towards read. Um, if you've been involved with the schools for long enough, we used to get 30% reimbursement back for charter schools. Uh, this is a slight step because you now get a point two back if you have a large population, well, any population. I think every school district but one gets at least one student added back to their ADM and the reflection of their charter schools. Only one school district didn't have anyone that was in a charter school. Um, but that, what it is, they look at your charter school population, they'll do a, a point two um, to that, and that's the number of students that get added back into your ADM. And the point here is that you have to keep track of your ADM. You'll notice as you go across the, the columns, your ADM is growing. So then you're going to end up with the final weighted ADM. And that's what we have here. So you take all the ADMs, and you end up with your weighted student count. Then we go to the district. The district adjustments are, are factors that uh, reflect the community, the tax resources that you have, the medium household income, and we'll walk you through that. The first one is the sparsity size. You have to be an extremely small school district in a very large uh, miles. Very few schools qualify for that, um, and uh, you are not one. <laughs> so you get a zero for that one. On your median household income, you actually fall kind of in the middle 
ish for your school for your county. So you're at about sixty-seven thousand, if I remember the number pretty correctly. Yeah, uh, the lowest was Reading at twenty-six thousand, and I think the highest was like seventy-six thousand. But you, there was, you're kind of falling in, in the, pretty close to what the rest of the area that you have. What that does, though, is that they look at what the um, we'll go to the slide. Median household income for the entire state, for the Commonwealth. Last year was a different number. It's gone up. It is now 53,115. They take your median household income and they may do a factor. You are over the median household income, so your factor is, if you look at your index, is 0 0.7, I believe. So that means that your ADMs actually will be lowered because of your median household income because this is supposed to be reflective of the needs of the population that you have. The next part that you're going to look at is what is your local effort capacity index. This is extremely complicated. Um, it would take me probably a half hour just to go through this component. If you really want to truly understand this, I can go through it. Um, I believe most business managers have gone through the training through PASCO on this because you're looking at the entire local revenue dollars divided by your total number of households, and then they do a, a different median calculations, and the bottom line is, it looks at how much effort a community puts toward raising money for their schools. So you have your, your local effort and your local capacity. The local effort is reflective of how much you actually do, so if you're really high spending compared to the state median, that goes into your factor, and the local capacity, is the actual um, your ability? If you're in a tax base that doesn't have the ability to raise taxes, this this goes into your factor. You add those two together, and you come up with your index. So the bottom line is starts out here. You're going to have your ADMs and your sparsity, and then you're going to multiply by the first two columns, and you end up with your final ADM number, and that's the last column. So you'll see the growth that reflects from the beginning to the end of what happens to your population with the formula. Then they'll take the entire amount of money that's going to be pushed through the formula, it gets, you're, you get a prorated number, and then that'll push out how much money goes to your district. Um, you guys are about 116,000, I think, or 160,000. So you have a, a, a small amount of money that's increased for your uh, year that you just finished. It came after you know, long, hard months of work. Um, and just for future reference, now we have a base here. If, the, if things go as we hope, and this formula is used next year, the $150 million that was put in the year that we currently are in, and whatever additional money, like let's say it's only $50 million, that's the lowest number we've heard, and we're looking for much more, but then that, what, what that means though is that $200 million then will go through the formula using your updated idea. And that it's all reported in through your reports and through how all the other statewide numbers fall into place, and that'll determine how much money you receive. So, what can you do with school board members? This is basically what we're doing here as circuit riders. We're advocacy builders. We're trying to make sure that people understand what this process is and how important it is to the state and how important it is for our students that we actually have a formula that reflects the demographics. So we would like people to join the campaign, which is at fairfundingpa.org. You can follow me, but I am not really your official circuit writer. Um, Tom Seidenberger is yours. He is um, lucky to be away. He asked me to fill in for him this evening. Um, but I'm sure that if you would like to follow him on Twitter, you can do that as well. Um, but also, if you just follow, uh, Twitter is actually a very good educational tool to track articles on things that are happening. I know a lot of people hate Twitter, um, but it really is a, um, I, have, I have a school board, uh, my school business manager, he won't go on Twitter. And so I always had to tell him what I read on Twitter that day, and I said, if you just went on Twitter, you would know what happened at the house today. Uh, for example, uh, 1552, and that'll be my last comment of the night. 1552 is a vehicle that was put, um, the funding formula was put into. The Senate put it out uh, last week, and it was supposed to be voted for today. Uh, unfortunately, they added some additional amendments dealing with 
Wilkinsburg and Chester Upland, I'm not sure how familiar you are with those schools. Those schools are in uh, dire financial need um, and they need some additional funding and they can't figure out how to do that, so they decide not to vote on anything. So the formula was not voted on today, as hoped, and it looks like it won't be voted on this week. Uh, but we are pushing out information through the campaign. It's important for people to contact their legislators. We do believe that we have strong support um, among the representatives that are going to be voting on this in the next week. The Senate passed it out 49 to 1. That's how strong people feel about the formula and how we're ready for it in Pennsylvania. We just need to make sure it's not derailed by what happened today. That, uh, that people look at the wrong issue. We know it's important for us to do that. So uh, you know, if you follow the campaign and you get information about it, we would appreciate you reaching out to make sure that it does get voted on shortly. And the last thing is that, we always like to end, that schools need an equitable, adequate, fair, predictable, and an accounting state funding formula. And that's what we're all working for. I hope that I wasn't too quick. 15 minutes is, you know, just about enough time to read a little when I have to do this. So, um, do you have any questions? The only other thing is, as I wanted to point out, I don't know if um, Tom forwarded to you. He has another way of looking at a summary for your school district. I find that this is uh, harder. Um, so I just wanted to look how to get it. Um, when people look at the formula, I have it. You can see the numbers. It means more. I used to do it when people were looking at abstract and they didn't really understand, but seeing how the percentage and how it drives. Um, but he has a brief summary that has another way of looking at it. He did send the additional. He did send additional documents. Yes, I do have it. So I'll push okay. that as part of the um, update. This actually, I'll do it after the board meeting. Yes, it's, it's exactly the same numbers that I gave you. It's just in a different format. It, and and it's it, it's a little fancier what he did. I prefer it you know, walking across the spreadsheet. That's how it's all been handed out to us, and that's how we've been doing it. So um, just want to thank you again, and I appreciate your um, efforts, anything that you can do to help us uh, make sure that our students have a stable funding stream as important. And, and we thank you, Sandra, because this is something, and as you referenced, Tom Seidenberger is our circuit writer for this region, and Tom frequently comes to the superintendent meetings at the IU and will give us updates. And as you know, this has been a very difficult year with budget, and, and certainly looking for it and hoping for this basic education funding formula that is fair will help all districts. Um, as, as you know, I was at the Superintendent's Academy last week, and there were some folks there from out of state, and we had the opportunity to talk with them. Oh. And actually, some of them were looking very puzzled, saying, what do you mean you don't have a fair funding formula for schools? I mean, it actually <coughs> sidetracked, bless you, the conversation, because they were just in awe that we don't have a funding formula. And so for the betterment of our kids and, and for the needs that our students have, we really do need to have this fair funding formula in place. This slide is in here very strategically because you're seeing the very large and reputable organizations across the state who are backing the circuit writers, who go across and travel the state to do just this, is talk about what this actually means. And so I think when we talk about, about fair funding, it's easy to talk about it like the balloon that floats. But when you start to see it tied to your numbers and we start to look at, so what does this mean for why I'm missing? It, it tells a story that, that hits us a little closer to home. So I want to thank you for your efforts and all that you do along with the other circuit riders in your advocacy to, to implement change. We appreciate it. Um, the goal at this stage is to continue building a, an advocacy network across the state and to continue because the final point would be is having a formula will only get us so far. Um, and we now have to make sure that we actually have enough followers pushed through that formula. The campaign, as of still today, but we're not sure how much longer that will go. We're still advocating for another $400 million to be pushed through. The $400 million was what we had asked for last year, only received $200 million. Um, a good example, about $500 million was required for PEASERS alone. Um, so most schools did not get ahead, even with the two, you know, 150 and then the, you know, 50 for your RTLs. So at this stage, we need to make sure that we still fight for advocacy, and we try to make sure that we um, make an investment in our students, and not just a formula. So there is two prongs for this. Thank you all very much, and do not hesitate to reach out and contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
lock, it'll lock him in the drawer as I was heading out. So I'm ready to head out. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who has a comment tonight? Let's go on to routine approvals. It is recommended that the Board of School Directors approve the following minutes. April 11, 2016, business meeting with committee reports. April 19, 2016, special meeting. April 25th, 2016, business meeting. May I have a motion? A second? Second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Slyler, may I roll call, please? Mrs. Bradford. Yes. Mrs. Zilkowski. Yes. Mrs. Larkin. Yes. Mr. Painter. Yes. Mr. Redmer. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. Mrs. Riley. Yes. Mrs. Taylor. Yes. Eight. Yes. It is recommended the Board of School Directors accept the Treasurer's report. May I have a motion? So moved. Second? That's second. Is there any discussion? School directors approve payment of bills for the month of April 2016 as listed in the financial packet. May I have a motion, please? Second. Is there any discussion? I have a question. I noticed just looking through um, the paperwork that we um, hire a law firm, a couple different ones. There's an Edgar Nevins and McAllister. There's a sweet puts something else. Um, just as a new board member, we have different lawyers for different facets of our world. Is that correct? So we have Kellen for basic legal um, help, and then we farm out when we need other things. Is that how it works? Okay. So Sweet Stevens, Sorry. that's uh, specifically for special education. Okay. Um, the Abner, that might have been for uh, a call about the uh, running hospital. Okay. okay. Uh, Mrs. Fowler, may I have a call, please? Mr. Sorkin. Yes. Mr. Tainer. Yes. Mr. Bedner. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. Yes. Mrs. Taylor. Yes. Mrs. Waxman. Yes. Mrs. Zilkowski. Yes. Eight. Yes. Okay, Mrs. Vicente, the superintendent. Before um, I begin with the actual curriculum and technology items, there are a couple of good news items to share. Um, over the weekend, we had some phenomenal um, athletes. And so over the weekend, our girls track actually won the district championship. This is the first time since 2004. So that's a, a great congratulations to them. Um, individual winners in the track and field competition included Cassidy Kuhn, Madison Peace, and Joe Cullen. Um, also, the boys' tennis team has won the league, county, and district titles, and then they also finished as runner-up in Hershey, too, and I never say this right so quickly. I never say that correctly, so we lost them, but, but good for them. Um, also, last week on Wednesday, we had the annual academic awards at the high school, and I would encourage you, I know they're during the day and that can be tough to be there, but it really is recognizing the outstanding achievements of our students, both through academics and also their altruistic activities. Um, Caroline Allen, I got an email right before board meeting, so I don't know if you saw the article in the Reading Eagle, but Caroline Allen is representing Berks County in the National Scripps Spelling Bee. And so I, I sent an email to, to her parents, and um, there are all kinds of activities. Kristen was sharing, it, it's just all kinds of fanfare for the kids down in Washington. So um, before she went to bed last night, she studied 400 words. Mm -hmm. The bags were packed, and um, Joe sent me an email this morning and said, when we get pictures, that, that he'll send them to us. And then finally, the Why Not Awards are um, will be held this Wednesday at the Santander Performing Arts Theater at um, 6.30. 
And, and I don't know how familiar you are with the Wine Out Awards. We're actually nominated in nine different categories for Music Man. It's not a competition. It's actually like the Tony Awards. So it really celebrates. And, and Berks County is very blessed with the talent of, of the shows that are across the county. And this highlights the outstanding performances of kids and small groups. So um, that's Wednesday night. So just to share some good news items with you. Moving into the curriculum and technology portion of the agenda, it is recommended that the Board of Directors approve the following curriculum and technology items, number one through four. May I have a motion? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Filer, may I have a roll call, please? Under finance and facilities, it is recommended that the Board of School Directors approve the following finance and facility items, number 1 through 12. May I have a motion, please? Second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Filer, may I have a call, please? Mr. Redner. Yes. Mrs. Reese. Yes. Mrs. Riley. Yes. Mrs. Taylor. Yes. Mrs. Waxler. Yes. Mrs. Lukowski. And under personnel and policy, it is recommended that the Board of School Directors approve the following personnel and policy items, number one through seven. May I have a motion, please? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Filer, may I have a roll call, please? Mrs. Reese. Yes. Riley. Yes. Taylor. Yes. Mrs. Waxler. Yes. Mrs. Zilkowski. Yes. Mrs. Borkin. Yes. Mrs. Payne. Yes. Mr. Redman. Yes. Eight. Yes. Um, is there any old business? Is there any new business? Um, I'm just going to address one that's been out swirling around the news lately. Um, our top priority as a district is to ensure that all our students feel safe, secure, and respected. There's been a lot of attention, me wide media coverage, and contact by individual community members about the Department of Justice and the Department of Education's guidelines for the rights of transgender students under Title IX. The board has begun to educate itself by reviewing relevant documents, including the Dear Colleagues letter, examples of policies and emergency pra emerging practices, the PSBA statement, and related news articles. We're also awaiting information and guidance from our solicitor as to the impact of the guidelines on districts. The board and the district take the safety, security, and respect of all our students, including transgender students, as our most important responsibility. To be clear, the board has not made any decisions or taken any actions. We are still reviewing information and waiting on guidance from our solicitor. We will continue to, as we have in the past, deal with these types of issues in a common sense, empathetic, measured approach that respects and supports all of our students. The lines of communication with the community will continue to be open, and should any actions be considered, they will be discussed publicly. Um, right to knows are in the agenda, and we have updates from organizations, WAEA, AFSCME, WAIF. Um, two very successful parties down and two to go. <laughs> Remaining two are the Hills and West Reading, and they will be June 4th and June 8th. Thank you. Um, and I have a PTA update uh, from, jo from Joanne, Mrs. Weller. She says, thanks to all the support of the PTA this past year. We appreciate all the support for the PTA from administration, school board, teachers, staff, community, and volunteers. Staff Appreciation Week was celebrated May 9th to the 13th at all three schools, including um, a big luncheon on Thursday, May 12th. Uh, the last Reading is Fundamental event is scheduled to be held this Thursday, May 26th. Cross your fingers for good weather because this is a rescheduled date. Um, and the last PTA meeting was held Wednesday, May 18th, and a new PTA board was elected. So we have Becky Campbell stepped up to be president. Megan Lynch is going to be vice president. Selena Geist is recording secretary. Megan Falloon is corresponding secretary. And Helen Stratton Brown, or HSB as I know her, is the treasurer. So we thank all of those. Uh, parents for stepping up. Um, if there's no further business, may I please have a motion to adjourn? 
All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Oh, did I have a second? Maria, second again.